has done marvelous, he has done marvelous things. Praise the Lord, he has marvelous, done marvelous, marvelous, he has marvelous, done marvelous, marvelous things. thank you for this day. We thank you for waking us up this morning and giving us the opportunity to watch this service. Um, thank you for the service that is to come. We thank you for giving us the chance to read more about your word and your son. Um, we pray that the service ahead will go in a manner that's pleasing to you and that those who are listening or watching it will learn more about your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And He will lift you up. And He will lift you up. So just humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up, and He will lift you up. It's amazing 
grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was was blind, but now I see. So just humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. We need to just humble thyself in the sight. Of the, of the Lord, and, and He, and he will, lift will lift you up, up. And, and He, and he will, lift will lift you up, up. And, and He, and he will, will lift you up, up. And, and He, he will lift you up. Just humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And He will lift you up. And He will lift you up. Good morning, Sheldon Heights Church of Christ and my Heights family in Chicago and abroad. And we praise God for you joining us here in the Cyber Sanctuary, wherever you may be, in whatever city or county you may be in, that God will bless you uh, in a special way this week, that this word and this service will resonate with you. Uh, there was a great writer by the name of Lucille Clifton who once said, celebrate with me that every day something has tried to take me down, but has failed. And I believe that's reason enough for us to celebrate this morning in the cyber sanctuary, in house, or wherever you may be, to cultivate and create within your space and your environment right where you are to just worship the Lord, to celebrate, to praise God, because some things have tried to take you down, but they have failed. They've tried to take your spirit. they try tried to take your joy. They've tried to have your determination. As a matter of fact, they've tried to have your very life. But God has blessed us with another day to be alive because we are single walking testimonies every single day that we live. And so it is a reason for us to celebrate every single time we get to gather as the family of God. Every single time we get to reflect on God's blessings, it is cause for us to celebrate. And so I encourage you, don't just spectate, but participate, celebrate with us in this worship service. And even throughout the week, have the spirit of praise and worship in your heart because you know what God has done for you. In that same vein, we want to talk about a scripture, a passage, an exegete, an excerpt of text that talks about uh, where we used to be and how we are progressing toward what God has called us to be. I want to turn your attention to the great letter known as Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 2, I'm going to read verses number 1 through 10. Quite a bit of reading this morning. I want you to get the impact and the brevity of everything Paul outlines here in these set of 10 verses. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 1, I'm going to be reading from the NIV version and the church said, Amen. Hear the Spirit. There Paul writes, and I'm reading from the NIV, it says in verse number one, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, 
in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse number three, hear this. All of us also lived among them at one point of time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature wraths and objects of God's judgment. Ah, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, for it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, but we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. I want you to catch that nuance in verse number 10 again. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. This is the verse we're going to key on, verse number 10. The word of God for the people of God. The people of God said, thanks be to God. I want to preach to you from the subject this morning, from disgrace to his grace. From disgrace to his grace. If you're there in the worship environment that you are in, could you repeat after me, say, from disgrace to his grace. To his grace. Amen. I want to pray with you before we get into this word. I'm super excited Uh, to get into this word. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, holy God, we come before you with our spirits humbly bowed now, realizing and recognizing that you are God all by yourself. We can search as far as the east is from the west and from the north is from the south, and we will never find another God like you. So God, right now, we ask that you cultivate the soil of our souls, that we can hear a word from you. God, you are the source of all heavenly blessings, and we come before you now, before your throne of grace and mercy, asking in this worship hour and in this preaching moment that you will carry this word with understanding and that you will help us to find uh, this word in a meaningful way. And if you do this, Father God, we will make sure that we give you all the glory, the honor, and praise that is due to your name, now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. This particular text, very special because it relates to us a literary screenshot, if you will, or a split screen of what we used to be and what we are now. I know a lot of you all during this COVID-19 pandemic have been watching a lot of things, whether it be from Netflix to politic, you know, politics on the news, you've been watching movies with your families, you've been watching YouTube, you've been watching a lot of things, but if you're familiar at all with the popular trends in TV land today, In homes across the country, we spend hours every week watching our favorites like Love and Hip Hop, Basketball Wives, and Real Housewives of Atlanta, The Voice, R&B Divas, Dancing with the Stars, The Bachelor, and This Is Us. But among the parade of reality shows that flash across your screen, or your flat back, or your fat back, or even your computer screen, One that comes to mind when I look at this text and as I meditate on the words therein, it comes to my mind a widely popular series, The Biggest Loser. Uh, You know this series, The Biggest Loser. Each season, a cast of -of out-of-shape contestants agree to challenging regiments and insane workouts and strict diets in order to, to lose as much weight as possible and become specimens of physical health and fitness. Each season closes and climaxes with what they call weigh-ins, where finalists mount a scale to reveal how much weight they've lost that season. But for a dramatic effect, what the producers would do, if you've ever seen the show, is that they will split the screen, the TV screen, and they'll give you a side-by-side contrast of what they look like before and after the experiment. They show you a picture of the contestants and what they look like before the workouts, before the training, before the dieting. And just next to that, they'll show you where they came from. (laughs) They'll show you a line shot of what the contestants look like before they agree to this traumatic 
uh, and dramatic actual transformation that they've had experience for the better. What am I saying? Well, in the same way here in the second chapter of the book of Ephesians, Paul has created a literary and spiritual split screen, if you will, of his readers' lives before and after they accepted Christ. He reminds them that they were once dead in their sins, dead in their transgressions, and dead in their toxic thoughts. They were once a disappointing disgrace. But he shows them now that they have become saved by his grace. He shows them how trifling their lives were before they came to Jesus. He shows them how messy their lives were before they had union with God. And then he keeps on writing and then he reminds them and he explains to them this new life that they now have experienced in Christ Jesus because of the completed work of Jesus on Calvary's cross. And I stop by to tell you, if there's one thing I want to make sure I want to say is that we ought to be reminded every now and again of where we came from. I know sometimes we come in the cyber sanctuary with a lot of pride and we, we, we think that we have been arriving at the spirit uh, level of spirituality. We've been arriving at this climax of our journey. But we got to remember that we weren't always living as holy as we were now. We weren't always singing, I'm going that way. We weren't always singing, everybody will be happy over there. And so Paul reminds us of the contrast. He shows them that at one time in their lives, they were once a dead, disappointing disgrace. But now, through life in Christ Jesus, they are now covered by the blood. And now they are a person living under grace and the mercy of God. He says in verse number 10, I don't want you to miss this. He says, for we are his workmanship. What a vivid word picture here. Paul tells us that those who have expressed faith in Christ Jesus and demonstrated in Christ Jesus are now God's workmanship. I want you to see this. This is the word in Greek known as poema. It's the ancient Greek word by the name of poema, which is translated into workmanship. And as you may be able to connect, this is where we get the word in English poem from or master or art piece. That is the best piece. It was generally used to describe an artwork, whether it be a statue, a painting or a song, whatever the case will be. That literally meant that whatever it was in its art form was the best piece that the master had created, thus it being a masterpiece. So back when in antiquities days, during Paul's day, there will be apprentices who worked alongside a master, just like an intern in our today's society. They will work alongside someone who was experienced and also had a set of particular skills. And for this person uh, to study up under a person who was a master of what they were doing, this will bring them to bring the best out of them. And this this apprentice would work with the master for a number of years until the master felt as if the apprentice had mastered the craft. But the apprentice did not simply become a master craftsman simply because the master said so. The apprentice had to prove that he had mastered his craft. And so what the apprentice began to do is was he was working on his own unique piece. And this piece will be his best piece. And that would be the art piece that proved that he had mastered his craft, especially after working under someone trying to train for the experience. And so essentially this, this term masterpiece gets its birth through this process. Now watch this now. When Paul says that we are his workmanship, what he's literally saying is that you and I are God's masterpiece. <laughs> when God saved you by his grace and your active faith, You became the very best of creation. You became the very best that God created. We're talking about the same God who stepped out on nothing and created something. We're talking about the same God who started the clock when eternity's passed. And we're talking about the same God who formed the universe from one verse or one sentence. Paul says out of all of that, you are the very best that he's ever created. And you're the best ever that he's ever created The best thing that he ever created was to save a sinner by his grace. In other words, if God had some friends worth bragging to about being God, 
he will point to you and I. He will point to those who had addiction, but, but, but then now they are clean. He will point to the prostitute who he put on a better path. He will point to the liar and find the gossiper who laid down that path to become a child of God as the best thing God ever did. Did you hear what I said? I said, out of all the things that God has done, creating the sun, the moon, the stars, and the sea, God says you are his, mas his masterpiece. You're the best thing that he's ever created. Did you, see, did you hear what I said? I said, as flawed as we are, as broken as we are, as complicated and nuanced as we are, God says you are the best thing that he ever created. And somebody in the house needs to hear that today because you grew up all your life with someone telling you you wouldn't amount to anything. You grew up in your life and people were telling you that you wouldn't become anything and they were doubting you and writing you off and that you weren't worth anything. And, and, and God says, no, I don't listen to them because I'm calling you a masterpiece. I'm talking to some women in the cyber sanctuary who have been in relationships with men and men have, have told you countless of times that you weren't worth a dime. They used you and abused you. But I want you to understand that when God looks at you, he doesn't see you for what you can give to him, but he looks at you to see that you have his imprint within you. You are his masterpiece, his workmanship. Paul goes on to say, not only are you the best that he ever created, and Paul wants you to know that you have a purpose now that you can walk in. So when God saves you, when God acknowledges your identity, God gives you a purpose. A purpose that is tailor made for you to work in the kingdom, not because you need to be saved by that work, but because you are saved. And so this should naturally cause us to do work. I always get rattled when people say that there is a dichotomy between faith and works, that there is some type of division between them. What Paul seems to suggest to us is that when you are saved, when you have faith, it should automatically lead to work. That it should naturally flow from your heart of gratitude, something that you do for God because God has purposed it and gifted you with that thing to do for him. So listen, work and faith are both good and they work together as we are created into a masterpiece. And so look at this in verse number 10 in A and B. It says, God has ordained before time that you should walk in them. So listen, Paul here profoundly points to God's plan and God's purpose for those who have been saved by grace and those who are born again through baptism. Paul says that as God's masterpiece, he says here that ministry should be instinctive. As a person who has been saved by grace, our service should be seamless and our good works should flow from our daily walk with God. In the same way, you never have to teach a fish how to swim, a baby how to cry, a good student how to study. Uh, you, you, you don't have to teach a Christian the importance of good works and service. Because when a Christian understands how they have been transformed into a friend of God and transformed from a sinner to those who are receiving salvation, and they are quick to minister, to act and serve one another so that they can see the light of the gospel, the good news. And beloved, we've been seeing so many bad news in this world and in this year. There are people who need the good news, the good news that Jesus is trying to save them Jesus is trying to help them to understand that they are masterpieces, not because of what they can accomplish, not because of their pedigree, but because of who they are in Christ Jesus, because of the decision they make to give their life to him. And once you do that, you are a masterpiece of God. And so in its original language here, this implication in this scripture indicates that this is this work is something profitable, that the purpose that God gives you benefits the common good of community and church. And why am I saying that? Because we have to understand that our purpose is not simply about serving ourselves. Our purpose is not simply about getting salvation ourselves, but our purpose is about showing others how to receive the good news. There are some strong implications here. The implications here are if sharing your faith gives you fits, 
if showing grace to others gives you grief, then your status among the saved is suspect. Consequently, if you don't have a desire to serve and minister to others, then your conversion is questionable. So if we don't have the desire and the passion to show others the good news that transformed our lives, then it shows us a little bit about ourselves. It reveals and tells us that we may need to reevaluate our purpose and our priorities back to serving God and those on behalf of the God who saved us. And so the true mark of a Christian is someone who naturally serves other people, doing good works in faith. He, he says that when we demonstrate grace toward others, he says we're following the pattern that Paul says in verse number 10, that God has before ordained that we should walk in them, that, that God ordained something for you before you even knew that God ordained it for you. Isn't it good to know that before you were conceived, before that you were born, God had a purpose for you, that God wanted to see you saved, that God didn't want you to see yourself self-sabotaged by your mistakes in your past. God wanted you to know that he's always been with you and always has been there to encourage you to give your burden back to him. And so God has before ordained that we should walk in our purpose. In other words, the works that we do are ordered by the Lord. It's like the psalm that, that says, Order my steps in your word, dear Lord. Lead me, guide me every single day. Send your anointing, Father, I pray. pray. Please order my steps in your word. This song relates to the fact that we need God to order our steps while we work in the kingdom and work in our purpose. Because we're not going to understand our purpose overnight, but God has destined us to grow along in this process so that we can be fruitful and effective in the kingdom of God and in the world. And so when God saved you and when God saves you, he already had your assignment in mind. And to be clear, Paul is not saying that there is work that you can do that is only for you. Uh, he's, he's saying that there is some work that is assigned for you because of the gifts upon your life. So he's not saying that there's only work that only you could do, that if you step away from the project, if you step away from the plow, if you step away from the purpose that God has placed on you, that it can't be done. No, what he's saying is that there is something that God has purpose for you to do, but it's going to get done regardless. Now, don't look at me like that with your sanctified imagination. You all know the nation of Israel, when they were going throughout the wilderness, they forgot their purpose. Sometimes they didn't even worship God. They became idolatrous and they, they wanted to be even agnostic. And God accomplished his purpose through other people. And so that's not to say that God has given you a work that only can be fulfilled by your hands. But God is saying, I'm going to get it done regardless, but I want you to do a certain work. And that's important because we have people who feel as if that if they stop, the whole ministry stops. That if they stop coming to church, then the whole church will suffer, will become it. Well, we have to understand that God has not placed within one person the power of the kingdom. God has not placed within one person the whole assignment of uh, the divine uh, agenda. God can get his purpose done regardless, but the beauty of it all is that God chooses us to participate in the kingdom because he has given us some stuff so that we can accomplish what he has set out for us to do. And so to, to be clear, Paul is not saying there is not so, so much work that you only can do as much as he's saying that there is work that God has specifically assigned for you to do. This is significant because people need to understand that even though they have had positions for so long and they've been in the church for so long, that they feel as if they decide to up and leave or decide to sit down, that everything's going to fall apart. Now, God is bigger than the individuals and personnel around us. But God is going to get his gospel out there. God is going to save and God is going to do what he only can do. And it's our job to be grateful that we can participate and give it our all as we serve the Lord. Because how many know that God can still raise up somebody else? One star doesn't stop the show. And so Paul is not suggesting that there's work only that you can do. 
as much as he's saying that there is work that you specifically can do. When you were converted to Christ, you were converted with an assignment. And the beauty of it all is that we're not working alone. You don't do it by yourself. The text says that God, in essence, prepares the way for us to minister as a masterpiece of God. Somebody's thinking, preacher, I've been hearing you preach for the last several minutes talking about I'm a, I'm a masterpiece and how I am a workmanship of God, that I am a result of God's best. You wouldn't call me a masterpiece if you knew some of the places I've been. And some of you would say you wouldn't call me a masterpiece if you really understood some of the things that I've done. You wouldn't call me a masterpiece if you knew what I said last week. You wouldn't call me a masterpiece if you knew how little I read my Bible and prayed. But I want to let you know that maybe we have some things that that leave us broken. Sometimes we have some things that leave us scarred. Sometimes we have some things that hinder us as a hurdle. But God and I want to continue this continue you this morning that God is in the business of healing the broken and messed up places in your life. God has a unique way of loving you while at the same time seeing the best in you. When all you see is the worst in you, God calls you a masterpiece. And I think a show articulately, really articulates this in a great way. It was a show before my time, a very popular TV show that has apex from the beginning to the late 70s. This particular show, you all know, because this is perhaps what you grew up watching every single week. The show called Sanford and Son. This particular show, you know the show, uh, was about a family, particularly an individual, who appreciated what people gave up on. And I appreciated what Sanford did. He was in the junkyard business. Okay, I, I, I forgot that this is an educated church. He wasn't in the junkyard business. He was a salvage technician. He was a salvage engineer. That might be better for you. He was a salvage engineer. And if you know anybody in that vocation, amen, somebody would know uh, that you will see a lot of things that people have thrown out. And sometimes what Sanford would do is collect and take things that were broken and have seemingly lost their value. Things that have become so dysfunctional that they have seemingly lost their purpose and so they have been discarded and tossed aside. Things that would be thrown away because people didn't see the worth in the thing anymore. Fred was in the business of taking those things that were broken and dysfunctional and renewing those things. He was in the business of restoring value to them. What am I saying? I'm just saying simply that God is in the junkyard business. God is a salvage technician. God is a salvage engineer. He's a salvation engineer. God wants to restore the broken parts of your life. God wants to restore the dysfunctional parts of your life. And God wants to make you more whole day by day so that you can work in your purpose and find and reevaluate the value that not what people say about you, but what God says about you, that you're a masterpiece. Because God does not desire for us to stay in the miry clay. God does not desire for us to stay in our mess. But God wants us to be reformed into beautiful, divine masterpieces. God is so compelling because he sees in us all of our mistakes. But at the same time, he loves us and sees what we can be. He wants us and he nudges us forward so that we can become what we can become. And now, once we progress along in the life of salvation and journeying through the life of justification and sanctification, we can see where we used to be. We can see the literary and spiritual split screen that we used to do some things that we had to do that we had to say some things that we couldn't let go. We had to think on some thoughts that we just couldn't get around. But God says, you've been able to have some victories. You've been able to get over some hurdles. You've been able to break through some barriers and have a breakthrough spiritually. Keep on going. And can't you see Paul doing what God does to the person of Jesus Christ? He's encouraging us to keep on going. Yes, 2020 has been broken. Yes, our personal lives have been strained, but the scripture and the word of God and also the saints around us are telling us to go forward. Keep on going, friend, because although it may seem broken, 
God is in the business of taking the broken pieces and making us into beautiful masterpieces. Some of you wouldn't have the prayer life that you have unless you went through some things. Some of you wouldn't have the spirit of thanksgiving that you have unless you went through some things. And so God takes even the bad pieces of our lives to, be, to mold into the greater parts of our lives. And that's why the scripture says he works everything out together for the good. That means the bad pieces, the broken pieces, and the good pieces. He wants to take you under his wing and put you back together again. Paul it says here, essentially, that you got to appreciate God for being a redeemer once you understand the other side of the split screen. You got to appreciate God as your liberator once you understand the other side of the split screen. You got to appreciate God as your savior once you know the other side of where you used to be. Because I don't know how you feel about it, but I have spent some time in the junkyard of life. I've gone through some seasons in my life where I felt like I lost my purpose and I didn't know what God was trying to do in my life. I felt broken I, and I stand before you with stress and struggles even to this day. I stand before you, though, in the hands of a God who is willing and able to transform us and put us back together again. Anybody in the cyber sanctuary ever spent some time in the junkyard? I mean, have you ever spent some time in the junkyard of life? The reality is that there are some things in your life that you can't get straight without God. And so I know some, sometimes people say I have to get some things right and get some things straight before I come to God, before I give my life to God and become baptized. I know people say I have to really work on myself before I make that big decision. But can I remind you that there are some things only God can heal. There are some things only God can fix. And while you're spending so many years and seasons of your life trying to get yourself right, God is saying, if you came to me in the first place, I can make you back into a masterpiece again. And I think he's calling and compelling you, someone watching me here today, that even with your condition, God can not only bring you comfort, but God can change it for the better. The reality is that some things only heal because God has his hands on them. There are some wounds that only become better because God brings the antidote. And God is willing to put us back together again. It's similar to what many uh, people who are good with cars say. If once you ever have a broken car with an engine that's bad, you can replace that engine with another engine from a different car. For example, uh, there, there is the car by the name of a Ford, and there's a car by the name of a Jaguar. These are two different cars when it comes to luxurious class, but they're compatible for sharing parts. The Ford is a regular common car, but it's very useful. But sometimes Fords break down. And many people say that if a Ford breaks down or any car breaks down, they can be compatible to share the engine from a Jaguar or another luxurious car to make sure that that car runs again smoothly. What am I trying to say? I'm saying sometimes life breaks you down and you feel as if you can't get another break. You feel as if things are always going against you. And you feel as if God is already not present with you. But can I remind you that God is an ever present help, a refuge in times of trouble, and he's the agent and the affirmation of the possible in your life. So what God will sometimes do is trade a broken part of you for something that he has. He wants to exchange something with you. He wants you to bring your, your ashes so he can give you beauty. He wants you to bring your failures and your honesty so that he can give you peace forevermore. He wants you to give him your brokenness so that he can give you abundance. He wants you to give him your soul so that he can give you eternal life. I believe somebody here today has something to exchange with the master because there is no part, no substance, no element that God does not have to heal what's going on in your life. God wants to heal what's going on in your life. 
And God says, simply exchange what you have for what I have. This is why Jesus said, my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So I believe somebody here today, you want to exchange something with the Lord. Exchange the broken pieces of your life, the lesser pieces of your life, the, even the ones that seemingly have lost their purpose and their usefulness, so that God not only can heal, but reorient your life. God doesn't want to be the Lord of just some of your life. He wants to be the Lord of all your life. So as you exchange, God wants to make sure that he is ruling your life so that he can get you under the authority, guidance, and wisdom so that you can become the best version of you. We wouldn't be where we are to be today without accountability. And that's why the scripture says, for iron sharpens iron. God wants to sharpen you. God wants to make you better. And God wants to tell you that you are his masterpiece. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what you thought, God is not that far where he cannot save you. That God is not that far where he can't reorient your mind and keep your mind. God wants to be the one who gives birth to you, the, the beautiful masterpiece that you have not yet realized that you are yet. And so today, I want to offer the invitation for those who are seeking to trade in a piece of their life that's dysfunctional, or trade in a piece of their life, their spirit, their mentality, their personality, and even uh, their character for something that God has to offer. God said through the person and pen of Peter, repent and be baptized for every one of you for the remission of your sins. He wants you to be repenting and baptized so you can start the journey of cleansing and improvement. God is not just in the business of giving you everything that you want. God is in the business of making sure that once you have everything he gives you, you can keep it, that you can keep it with integrity, and that you can appreciate where you are now as compared to where you used to be. If that's you, we want to reach out to you to see that you are saved that you repent of your sins to acknowledge Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life by a simple confession that will save you once you go down in the water graves of baptism and come up in the newness of life where your old self will stay, but your new self will continue toward your destiny. God bless you now and forevermore. Where I first saw the light and 
the burdens of my heart were worn away. It was said by faith, I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day of the day. Good morning, family. At this time, I invite you to join us in this moment for communion. We will be reading the communion reading from Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 22. And it reads, and as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank all of it. And he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say unto you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. At this time, let us go to our Father in prayer. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you, dear Lord. Thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. The most important one, dear Lord, your son, Jesus Christ, who humbly came down and died on the cross for our sins. We pray, dear Lord, that as we take this communion, this bread and this wine, that we do so in a way that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. This is our prayer in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may now take the communion. Amen. Good morning, Sheldon Heights family. It is once again time for us to respond to God's goodness and his blessings. The leadership at the Sheldon Heights Church of Christ would like to thank every member that continues to give faithfully through this crisis. We have been receiving your gifts through the Give Plus app we received it in the mail and also through the lockbox. And all of these can be found and accessed on our website, sheldonheights.com. Continuing the theme of remaining faithful through adversity, let us take a look at the widow at Zarephath and Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. Let's look at her condition in verse 12. The New Living Translation reads, but she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. It is true, some of us are affected financially by the COVID-19 pandemic, but none of us are in the condition of this widow for she was preparing her last meal for her and her son to starve to death. But even in the midst of this adversity, let's listen to what God has to say to her. He says in verses 13 and 14, through Elijah the prophet, but Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Let me repeat that. God said to her and he says to us today, the first thing, don't be afraid. Go and do just as you said but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. In times of adversity such as these, if we will put God first, then he will make sure that what we have left will be enough. Now is the time for us to trust him and access his power through our faith. Let's take a moment and step back and look at our situations. Two, three weeks ago, we were fearful. We were filled with uncertainty, not knowing what the future held. But look at us today. We're standing. We have all that we need. We are making it through this storm. God has remained faithful and true to his word, he has not forsaken us. 
Let's praise God today with our giving in the midst of this storm. Let's go to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, the great God of heaven, we bow our heads before your throne of mercy and grace and awesome power, thanking you, Heavenly Father, for being true to your word and remaining faithful. Heavenly Father, you continue to feed us, you continue to protect us, you continue to bless us, Heavenly Father, even through the current situation. We're praying, Heavenly Father, that you will lead us and guide us in your ways. Heavenly Father, send your spirit to commune with our spirit, Heavenly Father, giving us assurance and faith, knowing, Heavenly Father, that you are with us. That no matter what we see with our eyes, Heavenly Father, we know by faith, Heavenly Father, that you will care for us. Please protect us. Please watch over us, Heavenly Father. Please cause this disease to pass over us, Heavenly Father, until we make it through to the other side. Give us the strength, the courage it takes, Heavenly Father, to bless your holy name even today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, everyone. I took time out just to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers and your donations and your continued blessings that you show toward I am. I am is embarking on a trip to Neba, which is in the DR. February the 5th to the 13th to bring that help, hope, and healing that we always do. In the midst of this pandemic, we know that God is going to bless us to go, be safe, stay healthy, and to return back. Continue to pray for us, watch over us, and always thank God for everything.
to be your child. I want to be your child. Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Love me, Lord. Love me, Lord. I want to be your child. I want to be God bless you. We hope that you've been blessed by our digital platform through YouTube and also on Facebook. We encourage you to keep on sharing the good news in this time and season of bad news. For the scriptures say that a good word is like medicine, sweet to the spirit and honey to the bones. And somebody in your circle, somebody in the community, and somebody at your church needs to hear the good news. So we ask that you continue to support this ministry. And we also ask that you continue to reach out for your spiritual needs so that we can pray for you throughout the week. That God will give you the grace that you need to deal with the issues that you face in your life. At this time, I want to pray for you and those who are watching online through our cyber sanctuary. At this time, let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we come now. Thank you for blessings seen and unseen, bringing us a mighty long way and helping us to appreciate where we are now as compared to where we used to be. God, help us to keep on going, being motivated and inspired to keep on going with all that we have toward the mark of the high calling. That is just toward your purpose for us in this world. God, we thank you for being a light uh, in your word. We thank you for being a a comforting word. We thank you for being a guiding word. We thank you, Father God, and we ask that you uh, now help us to be fruitful after this call to action in your word. Help us to bring forth fruit, something that is good, that grows, and that has seeds for your glory and your honor. God, help us to be flourishing disciples and all that you have called us to be. And if you do, we'll be so mindful and careful to surrender to you and now may the words of our mouths, the meditation of our heart, be delightful in your sight, O Lord, God, our strength and our redeemer. In the blessed name of Jesus, we ask this prayer. Amen. And so be it.